day, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation on Certificate of Confidentiality. The session will be recorded. All participant lines will remain in a listen-only mode. We will be opening the phone lines at the end of the call for comments and questions. If you experience technical difficulty, please press star zero for assistance. Now I'd like to direct your, the audience to force their screen to full view by pressing the small icon located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. You are looking for a blue box with arrows pointing out from the corners. Please click that icon now to bring the presentation to full view. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Liz. Liz, please go ahead. Thanks very much. Welcome, everyone, to today's presentation on the Certificate of Confidentiality. I'd like to thank Dr. Kathy Shores-Wilson and Katie Morales for presenting this topic today. Again, the lines will remain in a listen-only mode. We do encourage your comments, questions, and any kind of stories you have regarding the Certificate of Confidentiality. We will be asking for feedback towards the end of the presentation. At that time, you can press star 1 for the operator to open up your telephone line. Uh, so I will go ahead and let things get started and turn things over to you, Katie. Thanks, Liz. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie Morales, and I am a protocol specialist at the CCC. Today, Dr. Shores Wilson and I will be discussing the Certificate of Confidentiality. You may hear us refer to something called the COC. That's just short for Certificate of Confidentiality. We will start you off by having a cheesy but educational role-playing activity. We will be polling you, the audience, and as described on this slide, discussing the background and purpose of the COC, going over which research projects are eligible to receive a COC, discussing what the COC can and cannot protect, we will navigate through the application process, and finally, we will be discussing the Certificate of Confidentiality within the CTN. And now, Kathy and I will have a brief phone conversation. Hello, this is I'm a researcher. How can I help you today? Hi, this is Susie Q with the District Attorney's Office. The receptionist told me that I should be speaking to you about a person enrolled in your research study. His name is uh, Joe Smith. Can you please tell me the date he was enrolled in your study? Hi, Susie Q. I'd really like to help you, but unfortunately, that will just not be possible. We would never discuss our research participants or even confirm or deny their participation in our study. Oh, come on, Ima. I work for the government. All I need is the date Joe started participating in the drug study at your clinic and just some of his research records. I can get a subpoena if necessary. Oh, sorry, but our research is protected by our Certificate of Confidentiality, so even with a subpoena, we would not share this information with you. I'm happy to take your contact information, and I can have someone call you back to discuss this further with you if you like. I'd really like to help you. I'm so sorry I am just unable to do that. I can have another representative contact you very shortly. Would you like to give me a callback number? Okay, I guess I'll leave my number. So a research staff member's action during such an inquiry is very important. We plan to explain the purpose of the COC to better prepare you all for situations like this. The COC has been around in some form since the 1970s. It was a product of the drug wars that were going on at that time and the need to collect information on the extent of illegal drug use. The first form of the certificate was in an act created in 1970. It was called the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act. That was later amended in 1974 to include protections for research conducted on alcohol and psychoactive drug users. And finally, in 1988, it was amended again to include protections for health research in general. Now, as you can imagine, the COC has been challenged in court, and in 1973, it was upheld by the New York Court of Appeals in the court case People v. Newman. Subsequently, the Supreme Court declined to hear that case. Under Section 301D of the Public Health Service Act, the Secretary of Health and Human Services may authorize persons engaged in biomedical, behavioral, clinical, or other research to protect the privacy of individuals who are subjects of that research. This authority has been delegated to the National Institutes of Health. 
So you may be wondering, what is the purpose of the CSC? Most simply, it is to protect investigators, institutions, and research staff from being compelled to release information that could be used to identify research participants. This is important to keep in mind. Certificates protect against legal demands, such as court orders and subpoenas for identifying information or identifying characteristics of a research participant. It allows researchers to refuse to disclose identifying information on any civil, criminal, administrative, legislative, or other proceedings. However, researchers may not use the CSC in a coercive manner when recruiting subjects. So identifying information is broadly defined. It's not just the usual suspects such as a name, an address, or a social security number, but it can include any item or combination of items that could lead directly or indirectly to an individual. So for example, a date of birth might not be easily connected to a participant if given with no other information, but if you include the date of birth and the city that the participant lives in, that might be considered identifiable information. And now I will hand it over to Liz for our first polling question. Great. All right, let's jump over to the polling question. Have you ever encountered or know of a situation in which someone has used a certificate of confidentiality to protect participant information? Yes or no? The polls are now open. We'll wait a few moments for the responses to accumulate. Again, we do encourage anybody to share their stories with us if they do have some experience that they can offer um, the rest of the network. We will be opening up the phone lines probably towards the end of the call. Um, and really, again, encourage you to, to share your experiences with us. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and show them and review the results. So it looks like 65% um, of you have not had um, an experience where somebody has used a COC to protect participant information. However, 32% of you have. So again, we'd love to hear from you guys later on in the presentation. It would be a great contribution to this web conference. I'll go ahead and turn things back over to the presentation. And over to you, Kathy. Thanks, Liz. Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining today. Uh, I'm Kathy Shores Wilson, the Regulatory Director of the Texas Node. All the information that Katie shared with us about the certificate sounds really good. So can any kind of project be covered by a certificate? Not really. So now we're going to talk just a little bit about just what types of projects can obtain a certificate to protect its participants. These are single projects that have a well-defined research topic such as those we do in the CTN. The research can be a multi-site project, but there must be a coordinating center or a lead institution, and the lead institution can apply for the certificate on behalf of all the institutions that are associated with the project. For example, all of our CTN trials have a CSC that the lead team obtained for us. Also, the lead institution must ensure that all participating institutions conform to the application assurances. Projects must be IRB-approved research that is collecting identifying information and collecting the types of information that could negatively affect someone if disclosed in areas of life such as financial standing, employability, insurability, or reputation in the community. The types of sensitive information that could adversely affect someone includes collecting data on substance abuse or other illegal risk behaviors like we do in the CTN, collecting genetic information, collecting information on the psychological well-being of participants, or collecting information on sexual attitude, preferences, or practices. So on the other hand, projects that are not eligible for certificates are not research, not collecting personally identifiable information, not reviewed and approved by an IRB, and the type of information the project is collecting would not significantly harm or damage the participant if it was disclosed. Back to you, Katie. Thank you, Kathy. Kathy. So boundaries of protection, let's go over this. 
the COC does have limitations, so let's discuss them. It can protect identifying data, examples which are discussed earlier, and it is retroactive to when the study started and continues forever. The COC cannot protect information that is considered voluntary disclosure and is concerning child abuse, threat of harm to self or others, and reportable communicable diseases such as HIV. It's important that you check and see if your local facility has a policy on voluntary disclosure. The COC does not protect against voluntary disclosures by the researcher, but those disclosures must be specified in the informed consent form. For example, those topics I mentioned on the previous slide of child abuse or the threat of harm to self or others. A researcher may not rely on a certificate to withhold data if the participant consents in writing to the disclosure. Researchers should understand that inquiries or even subpoenas do not automatically require disclosure. Reporting to state or local authorities may or may not be waived by a requiring agency. And the COC acknowledges that certain disclosures are necessary. The site PI is responsible for providing guidance and handling inquiries. There are certain instances in which you may have to disclose identifying information. So for example, if your study is an IND and the FDA comes to audit the study, the FDA inspector has rights to review all study documents, even those that may include identifi identifiable information. But again, this type of disclosure should be in your consent form. COCs do not replace the need for data security. HIPAA and other regulatory protections still apply. And as I mentioned before, please be informed about your local facility's guidance on certificates of confidentiality and voluntary disclosures. And now I will hand it over to Kathy to discuss navigating the COC application process. Thanks, Katie. So this brings us to how do we actually get one of these wonderful certificates? The certificates are issued by the applicable institute within the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, or another appropriate funding agency. Although there are exceptions, such as studies with an IND involving an investigational new drug that would apply to the FDA, for us in the CTN, COCs are typically issued by NIDA. NIH, or Public Health Service Funding, is not required, but the research should match the Institute's mission. For example, projects applying to NIDA should have some type of focus on drug abuse. Certificate applications should be submitted three months prior to the planned enrollment day. You want to get everything in place to start your study, and it can take some time, since there are many COC applications being processed by each institute, so you do not want to wait to the last minute to think about it. The NIH application is actually 14 sections <clears throat> addressing information on the PI, the institution, and the protocol on the institution's letterhead. And that information is followed by a list of assurances. You must also have and include in your application packet the IRB approval letter, the IRB qualifications, and your IRB approved consent forms. This is because the COC coordinator will be reviewing your certificate language and your consent to make sure it meets the requirements of explaining the certificate appropriately. And lastly, the PI and the institutional official must sign the application when everything is complete. The PI and the institution are providing assurances and agreeing that they will protect against compelled disclosure and to support and defend the authority of the certificate against legal challenges, just like I'm a researcher did in our role play. They will comply with federal regulations that protect human participants. They will not represent the certificate as any type of endorsement of the project or use the certificate to coerce participation in the study in any way. They will also inform participants about the certificate, its protections, and limitations. And of course, that means that all of us as researchers are doing these same things as well. Some important reminders are you must notify the participants that a certificate is in effect in writing in the consent form. You must provide a fair and clear explanation of the certificate's protections, including limitations and any exceptions, and some of these may be local. Back to you, Katie. Thanks, Kathy. So let's discuss certificates of confidentiality within the CTN. Who needs to understand the COC? 
Well, as you can see on this slide, we all do. Basically, everyone on your research team, as well as your participants, need to understand the CFC. As a researcher, you may get inquiries from attorneys, spouses, or other family members about one of your participants, but you should think back to the role playing exercise that Kathy and I did in the beginning. It is important that you never acknowledge if the person in question is, in fact, in your research study. First, you should take the inquiring person's name and number and arrange a time to call them back later. Next, you should notify your study PI, the CCC, and other persons mentioned on this slide. They will give you further guidance as needed. So here we are at the take-home messages. The COC protects against most requirements to release information about research participants. Participants must be educated on the COC, including its limitations. The COCs are issued for single, well-defined IRB-approved projects. It cannot prevent voluntary disclosures. And finally, all personnel who have access to participant information need to understand and utilize COC protections. There is a great resource called the Certificate of Confidentiality Kiosk, and the website is provided here on the slide. It includes a wealth of information and probably will answer many of your questions if you're trying to apply for a COC in the future. So let's take a look at the website real quick. So if we scroll over, for example, there's a link that says flowchart. We open it. And this flowchart is a great example because it's it helps the person determine the appropriate contact for applying for a COC. So for most people within the CTN, the lead teams will be applying through the NIH and specifically NIDA. However, if your study happens to be an IND, there might be an instance that the lead team will be applying for the COC through the FDA. And now I will turn it over to Liz for a final polling question. Great. Okay. Move over to the polling question. You receive a call regarding a custody case involving a study participant. When the information is requested involving the participant, the research staff member should do which of the following? Acknowledge their participation in the research and pull their records. Call the call, um, excuse me, take the caller's name and number, contact your PI and follow site procedures. Ask for more information about the case or contact the participant for information to disclose information. I'm sorry, for permission to disclose information. The poll is now open. You can select your response. We'll wait for just a moment for some responses to accumulate. And again, encourage anybody who has any experience that they would like to share with the group to go ahead and press star one. We will be taking questions and comments shortly. I'll go ahead and show this poll results. Kathy, you want to go ahead and go over that? Sure. Well, it's good that uh, people felt comfortable to not just hand over the records, although some lawyer can sound very authoritative or someone else, like that they had a right to those records, so nobody felt uh, that they needed to do that. The best ideal thing to do is to take the contact information and then contact the PI and follow the, the local site procedures. So that's good. No one was tempted, but it might be tempting to ask about the case just out of curiosity, but you would not want to be going into that at this time. So again, uh, that one was not selected, so that's good. And we, we would have an instinct to contact the participant for permission about this, to let them know this was going on. And indeed, that might happen later on. But you first want to start with the PI and, and your local authorities, um, and they should lead that process from the beginning. But we did good on that poll. We did great on that poll. Okay. Okay, we have um, one last question to think about. And then again, as Liz said, everybody, please share your uh, stories about the certificate. Um, and have any of your participants had questions or concerns regarding the certificate of confidentiality, either during the informed consent process, which I would think that would typically occur, or even later on in the study? Please let us know. And if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and press star 1 now, and the operator can take your call. 
and we do have Louise Haynes online. Please go ahead. Hey, um, I did have a, have a question about um, the timing. You mentioned that uh, you should apply for the Certificate of Confidentiality three months prior to implementing the trial, but also that you need IRB approval before you can apply for um, the Certificate of Confidentiality. And those two things don't seem to go together very well. So. I wish. It, um, I wonder if you could comment some on the interaction or and the timing regarding uh, getting the certificate of confidentiality and the, and getting IRB approval for sure. it. Sure, that's, that's why I kind I kind of said uh, should apply three months. Uh, that typically doesn't happen because you do have to have IRB approval prior to uh, submitting the application. So. Uh, the, the kiosk does recommend applying three months, so uh, it is a good recommendation, but in the real world, it's rare that we can all get our IRB approvals and all that in place three months prior to when we plan to enroll. It, it's just an ideal. Well, but we have had trials where you started the trial without the certificate of confidentiality, and you were several months into the trial before you got the certificate of confidentiality. So. How did, what are the implications of that for people that are enrolled in the trial prior to getting the Certificate of Confidentiality? Well, that, some IRBs allow you to start enrollment without the certificate, like my site does, as long as the application is in process. And some don't. Uh, some require you to wait. Um, the reason a lot lets you go ahead and start is because the minute you obtain that certificate, those protections are retroactive. So it would protect the participants' records even prior to the date you received that certificate. But if you were, if if there were a request for records before you had received it, they may that, or may not. That is when you would contact the PI and the certificate coordinator and your local um, authorities to, to 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 know the best way to proceed. Uh, luckily, it is rare that people try and challenge their certificate because they've learned that their research records are protected, and I have not heard of a case like that. Uh, but you would just do the best you can, um, and then the way legal uh, matters run their course, you would probably have that certificate in hand anyway. Okay, thanks. Our next question is from Jack Shelley. Please go ahead. Thanks. And actually, just a comment. I wanted to pass along something we got from the uh, TUC office uh, um, a couple of years ago in terms of writing uh, consents and consent templates. And it's when we put in language about we will report on uh, any forms of abuse that are reported, child abuse, elder abuse, uh, adult dependent abuse, that sort of thing, it's important to uh, not put in the phrase as required by law because it weakens the COC, or that's the perception of the COC office at, uh, at NIDA. So I just wanted to bring that to uh, to the uh, to everybody's attention, and and uh, see you guys did a great job in the presentation. Thanks, Jack. Hey, we have yeah. no further no, we have no further participants in queue. Okay. So that does conclude today's webinar. Uh, this session was recorded and it will be available within um, before the end of the week on the dissemination library and on the CTN CCC training section of uh, LiveLink. Uh, we do have some upcoming webinars that you might want to mark your calendar for. Uh, we have integrated treatment of co-occurring disorders coming up on September 14th, informed consent on October 12th, and a new look at manual of operations development. I'm sorry, Manual of, of, of Procedure Development on December 7th. So once again, you will, be expect, you will receive a uh, survey request in email, so to give us any kind of feedback you have on this presentation or if you have any requests for further information regarding the Certificate of Confidentiality. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank Dr. Kathy Shores-Wilson and Katie Morales for presenting on this topic today and hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.